So Dr. Da D Daniel Holmes did his undergraduate degree in chemical physics from the University of Toronto with a focus on quantum mechanics. He went to medical school at the University of British Columbia where he did his residency, C, residency in medical biochemistry. He is a clinical associate professor of the pathology and laboratory medicine at UBC and the division head of the clinical chemistry at St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver. His interests include laboratory medicine, statistics, clinical endocrinology with a focus on secondary, <coughs> secondary hypertension, clinical lipidology, lipidology and clinical mass spectrometry, spectromy, spec spectrometry, thank you. Um, essay development efforts in the last five years have focused on novel use of mass spe spectro spectrometry, thank you, <laughs> for essays directed at specializing in endocrinology testing. Dr. Holmes runs St. Paul's lab. So if you live in BC, you know that this gentleman is checking our lab work when we get it sent in. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Holmes and his presentation. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Well, thanks, Deanna, for inviting me here. And some of my colleagues are here too. Uh, you, you, uh, you did well in reading my, there. Does that actually display? It's one of the few cases where the laser actually works. That's great. Right, there's a bottom button, and then the top button is the laser. Okay, yeah. It's the, backwards. Oh, everything, okay, so this is advanced? Okay, all right, it is kind of backwards, isn't it? Forward and back, that's kind of screwball. Okay, all right, so this, uh, I, I, I don't have to go fast because I only put in 30 slides, so some slides will take longer than others. Thanks to Deanna for inviting me. When she invited me uh, two years ago, she said, uh, can you speak on September 23rd? And I didn't look at the year. I'm so used to people inviting me to speak about three months ahead of time. And then I said, you know, there's, there's no Saturday, September 23rd this year. Oh, she says, oh, I'm talking about next year. I'm like, oh, okay. So we've had this We've had this prepared for two years. And even though I had two years to prepare on Monday, I'm writing her and I'm saying like, oh, my presentation's not done. Do you have my last presentation so I can't edit it? So that's the way my life is, unfortunately. Um, I'm at that stage. I have little kids and stuff like that. So we're going to talk about biochemical testing and acromegaly, so all your lab reports. And these lab reports... Are, I don't know whether this, these lab reports with respect to acromegaly appear on my eHealth, do they? Do you get them back on my eHealth or do you have to yeah. go to your doctor? Okay, so you get them on my eHealth, so uh, you will be seeing the numbers, and I'm going to try and explain to you what the numbers mean and why we measure them, and uh, in some of the ways in which the measurements are difficult or go wrong, and how we interpret them, and those kinds of things. Um, just so that I understand, how many people here took high school science course? So hands up if you took a high school science course, almost everybody. Hands up if you took a university science course. So that's pretty good. Uh, so some, and, and anyone take postgraduate science courses? Yeah, so we even have graduate degrees. All right, perfect. So some people are going to find this boring and too easy, and some people are going to find this confusing and too hard. I'll try and aim somewhere in the middle so that you understand uh, the, the difficulties, the challenges, and why we do this testing. So this is what we're going to answer. We're going to look a little bit of physiological background, which I'm sure most of you know, um, but maybe you'll learn a little bit of something or be reminded. What blood tests we use in acromegaly, how the diagnosis and monitoring tests differ from one another. That is, like, what tests do we use to find the disease? What tests do we use to uh, monitor the disease? pre- and post-surgery, uh, um, or in the, you might not have surgery, depending on your situation, so uh, how we would use the test then, if you're on medications. Um, what's growth hormone, how is it measured, which IGF-1 or insulin-like growth factor 1, and how is this measured, how it's measured, and, and are tests from different labs comparable to one another? Is anyone from Ontario? Anyone from Ontario here? Is everyone from BC? Is some people from Alberta? Anyone from Alberta? 
Okay, so uh, British Columbia is kind of fortunate in that we're small, and so the tests tend to be centralized, which makes the interpret the con the comparison between labs becomes kind of irrelevant because you're all in the same lab. Ontario is in a much different situation; it has about ten different labs doing these tests, and so uh, if they're not using the same uh, commercial method, then the results aren't necessarily comparable to one another. We'll talk a little bit about that. From Atlanta? Atlanta. Oh, Atlantic Canada. I'm like, why Atlanta of all places? And they've got the Coke Museum and now they've come up here. Okay, so welcome from the Atlantic provinces. You're probably in the same situation out east as we are here. It's just smaller province, probably all done in one place. So this is a little picture of your pituitary gland. And we, you may remember that the pituitary gland is governed by the hypothalamus. And so hormones go from the hypothalamus and direct the anterior and posterior pituitary glands. We're talking about the anterior pituitary gland. That means the front. Anterior means front. Posterior means back. So the hormones that we're primarily concerned with are hormones from the anterior pituitary. And uh, growth hormone uh, is manufactured in the anterior pituitary. But its actions are, its function uh, the growth effects are, n are not performed by the growth hormone itself. Mostly growth hormone's immediate action is to raise your blood sugar, but the growth effects come through another hormone called insulin-like growth factor one, which we'll talk about. Making sure I push the right button. So this is a, a cadaveric cross-section. This is a person cut in half. We're thankful for the volunteer. We don't want to be him. Um, I don't know whether it's a him or her, actually. There's the pituitary gland, okay? And if this grows, it, it, it uh, Dr. Akagami could tell you a lot more about this, but it can, you know, it can wear away at the bone and it can expand and push on the optic chiasm and impair your vision. Um, and maybe some of you, your first presentation was losing your peripheral vision. Um, or the first thing that you really notice, that is, after all the night sweats and stuff like that. So uh, that, that's, that's where all the action is when it comes to this disease. And this is a normal pituitary, I think. Dr. Akagami will be able to tell us. Okay, so <laughs> growth hormone, oops, sorry. Growth hormone manufactured in the pituitary has direct effects. And it's direct effects. Like when, when, if I infused you with growth hormone, the immediate effects would be to raise your blood sugar and increase the amount of, it would mobilize fat break down the fat, convert it to energy. So really, it's a, it's a response to fasting. It's a, it, it boosts your energy, if you like, by giving you sugar and fat. So that's why in kids who we might think are, a kid in whom we might think is growth hormone deficient, that is because they have short stature, one of the ways in which you can test them, is you can put them on a treadmill, uh, get them exercising, and then measure their growth hormone response to exercise, because growth hormone goes up when you exercise. Uh, which is not to say you should stop exercising, okay? <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> Please exercise. But uh, the immediate effect is to... So, so when we see this a lot in babies who um, are born from a diabetic mom, they become... They get low blood sugar in the neonatal period, and we can measure their growth hormone to make sure they're getting an appropriate response. They get really high growth hormone levels in response to um, the low blood sugar they get immediately after being born. These are kind of the effects that are not related to the disease of acromegaly. We don't particularly care about them, but we, there are a number of ways in which we can raise our blood sugar. Uh, adrenaline is one of them. Growth hormone is one of them. Cortisol is one of them. There's a whole bunch of different ways to which you could bl raise your blood sugar. With respect to acromegaly, what we care about is what growth hormone does in the liver. Growth hormone induces the... Um, the production of a hormone called IGF-1, or insulin-like growth factor 1. Uh, now, the, you see there's a bracket 2 there. It, there is an insulin-like growth factor 2, and there is an acromegaly-like disease associated with insulin-like growth factor 2, uh, but it's usually manufactured by a cancer, and so those who have IGF-2 producing tumors are in big trouble and probably wouldn't make it to a conference like this. They'd be very sick. So we're primarily concerned with IGF-1. The other thing, IGF-2 causes hypoglycemia. So those people get acromegaly-like symptoms and low blood sugar, not high blood sugar. Some of you might have, might have developed diabetes from your disease, and uh, that, uh, that, that doesn't happen 
with IGF-2. In any case, so what does IGF-1 do? It does all the things that, there's, that it's supposed to do in children. The levels are very high in the teenage years. It's supposed to make you grow. It's supposed to you know, make your skeleton enlarge. It's supposed to make your muscles bigger. That's why people abuse it. That's why people dope with growth hormone. Um, and that's why there are the World Anti-Doping Agency is interested in being able to detect growth hormone abuse. Um, lots of people are just ordering growth hormone, giving it to themselves, which uh, <laughs> seems kind of crazy. But anyways, so, uh, but when you're, when you're no longer growing and your growth plates are fused, the growth effects, as you know, are really limited to your hands, your feet, and the shape of your jaw and your forehead. And so some of you may have developed malocclusion of the, of the bite. Um, that's because of the growth of your jaw. Or you might, your teeth might have become spaced out from one another uh, as a result of having acromegaly. That's, uh, that's the effect you see. That's kind of the same effect when you see people uh, using anabolic steroids. They get the same kinds of effects. They get kind of enlarging of their forehead and, and um, enlarging of their hands. So those are the effects we care about. And then there are all the metabolic effects that go with that. Um, and, and, the, and the skin effects too, the skin tags and the thickening of the skin and the sweats. And so there's all these effects are, are mediated by IGF-1. So most patients, so let's talk about growth hormone. Most patients with acromegaly understand what growth hormone does, just shown you the immediate effects and the long-term effects that are done through IGF-1 but you might not understand what growth hormone is. So growth hormone is a short protein. There are big proteins and there are little proteins. Growth hormone is a short protein. You know, people have an idea what protein is from their life, from eating, uh, but they don't, might not know what a protein is from a chemistry standpoint. So we'll talk a little bit about that as it pertains to how we measure growth hormone. Most patients um, can name examples of foods that are protein uh, like, this is definitely a, a protein heavy meal. It's a fat heavy meal too. So basically, meat is protein, but what is a protein? So this is familiar protein. Let's talk about protein in unfamiliar terms. The easiest way to understand what a protein is is to think of it like a polymer, a plastic. Now, plastics are where you have the same, the same little unit, the same little building block repeated over and over and over again, the exact same, and it might branch. And the, different, the ways that the, pro, the polymers branch determines how that with their physical properties are so silic silicone has certain properties and polyethylene has certain properties and polypropylene has different properties well proteins are kind of the same thing except instead of having the same building block over and over again or uh, one two one two two different building blocks we got about 20 building blocks and depending on how we assemble those building blocks we get different structure if we make a short string of little lego blocks that are different from one another we get a short protein. If we get long ones, we get a big protein. And that's really uh, the fundamentals of what a protein is. There are 20 building blocks for proteins. You can think of them as 20 different Lego bricks with different color or different shape, if you like. And we string them together. They all fit together, and they're encoded by your genes. And depending on what the order is, you get different function for the protein. So some protein's job is entirely structural, like collagen job is to be, you know, holding you together at the level of your bones. And other protein's job is to transmit messages. And other protein's job, like antibodies, their job is to, you know, fight bacteria and viruses. And so you can make just about anything with these polymers. You can be very creative. It's like the world's most amazing Lego set. So they're all constructed of the same 20 amino acids. Those are the building blocks. All the amino acids have the same basic structure. It'll, it'll be relevant soon if you're getting bored. You're like, oh, why did I come here? <laughs> this, I didn't want to. I'm here to get support. <laughs> so this is what a protein looks like up close and personal. This is the polymer structure of a protein. Each one of these is an amino. Well, there's an amino acid, and there's an amino acid, and there's an amino acid. And they all have different R. They, the, the structure of these different R's is, is different for each amino acid. And so you just string them together, and you get different protein. In this case, we get somatotropin or growth hormone. So it's a small protein. 
And small proteins are not called proteinlets or proteinitas or proteinitos, but they're called, you'll see them called peptides. So it's a peptide. It has 191 amino acids. So that's, that's short in the domain of protein. But super short would be like three amino acids, five amino acids. There are some proteins like that. They don't last very long. Big protein might be, you know, thousands of amino acids. This one's on the small end at 191 amino acids. And um, the members of, when you build one of these proteins, the, the chain actually interacts with itself. It's kind of like magnetic, if you like, if you strung a whole bunch of weak magnets together and they could attract and repel. Well, magnets can only attract. Well, they can attract and repel. But you get that kind of effect like it'll fold. for It'll fold spontaneously. It can be incorrectly folded, but usually it'll fold correctly. Um, and so this is a schematic diagram of what growth hormone looks like. So we've taken the growth hormone and we've squished it out flat. This is not the way it looks in real life. In real life, it's a three-dimensional structure. But if you pulled it out straight and flattened it, that's what you get. And each of those little building blocks, there's phenylalanine and proline and threonine and isoleucine. Those are the little building blocks. And there it goes. And it has internal connections with, between itself. There's one right there. Two sulfurs bond to one another. And so these two cysteines are connected to one another. That's a schematic of growth hormone. And so that's what we got to measure. This is what it looks like when you just let it go and it folds properly. That's the way that its structure looks. Okay? And so you can see that the protein has a shape. And because it has a shape, it fits like lock and key into a receptor. And all of the effects of growth hormone are mediated by growth hormone fitting its receptor and either making those immediate effects, raising your blood sugar, or doing the long-term effects, IGF-1. All right, who cares? All right, so <laughs> onward, I care. So how do labs measure protein? So when you get a result from a lab, how did we figure, how do you measure? This is in micrograms per liter in the blood. The concentration is in micrograms per liter, millionths of a gram. Now what's a gram? A gram is one centimeter cube of water. So now we're measuring in the millionths of one centimeter cube of water, micrograms per liter. So you can see that it's technically demanding process. And it wasn't until probably the 1960s that we were able to begin measuring growth hormone. There were assays before that, but they didn't work by the principles of today. So how do we measure proteins in the lab? Well, we measure proteins with proteins, of course, because we can make proteins that will stick to IGF-1 or, or stick to growth hormone. And so we actually use antibodies, which are the things designed to fight off bacteria to measure growth hormone. All right, so when you go to the lab, oh, there you, you hate seeing them. You see there are all different colors of tubes there. Those are because different proteins and small molecules and blood components have different types of stability in different types of chemical environments. So we pick the tube so that whatever we're measuring will be still there when it finally gets to the lab. So we do growth hormone testing in either this red tube, which contains nothing, or this gold tube, which contains uh, some, uh, uh, this, this is just to separate the blood from the, the solid components of the blood from, from the, the liquid components of the blood. So those are the two. And you'll f we, we frequently use this type of tube. This has a, this has a, uh, something called EDTA that prevents um, your blood's own enzymes from auto-digesting the things we want to measure. So what's the lab process? Well, we collect your sample. We take it out. We centrifuge it to separate the solid components from the liquid components. We only measure these things in the liquid components of the blood. We, somebody, so this is what happens every time someone or doctor orders a test. And I think doctors forget, like, every time they sort of, as a whim, write something that somebody actually has to do it because it's all... You know, when they come and look at the lab, to them the lab is like there's like one person back there just pushing button over and over again, or maybe a hamster's running on a wheel. When they come back into the lab, I don't know if anyone watched Dr. Koo as a kid, but it's like the TARDIS to them is like, whoa, I thought it was, I thought it was just little. And they see like there's all this automation, there's people scurrying around. So uh, that's what happens when your blood tests get ordered. So the sample's collected, we centrifuge it, we, well, we label it, 
with your name and all that stuff and identifier and a barcode. We track it, we centrifuge it, we take a pipette and draw out the liquid component, leave the solid component behind, we freeze it. It's frozen and shipped frozen. So it's, sh it's fr frozen about minus 20 and it's shipped to us on dry ice from across the province to St. Paul's for IGF-1 anyway. We store it at minus 20 and then we thaw it and then when you freeze and thaw blood it tends to reclot. So you, get clot you don't want clots in your sample because they gum up your machine because the pipette's coming down trying to suck up a little, it's, it has a consistency of a, of a booger actually. <laughs> Um, so we take a, we take a, uh, we take literally take a wooden stir stick like you have for the coffee and rim the sample out, <laughs> throw the booger away, and then we analyze the sample. So it goes on to the analyzer and I'll explain the analytical process. Here's how all modern tests work like this. They're all based on what's called the ELISA principle. Now this is a simplification because there's like a million different ways to do this, but this is what happens. So we have, it doesn't work by a well anymore, but we have little magnetic beads that are coated with antibodies directed against growth hormone. How do you get antibodies directed against growth hormone? You inject growth hormone into, the simple way is to inject growth hormone, in, human growth hormone into a rabbit's thigh over and over and over again to induce, or a goat's thigh, to induce an Auto, an immune reaction against it, and then you collect their blood and purify the antibodies out. So that, that's how all of them work. Now, nowadays, they make, um, they make what are uh, artificial cells, if you like, that will manufacture these antibodies by the truckload. So they do it in, in um, an entirely in vitro environment, but some companies are still using goats. Some companies have whole herds of goats that are just made for making antibodies. Uh, so, antibodies directed against growth hormone are stuck on the bead. We put some of your blood in there and your growth hormone, the little red dot, sticks to the beads. Then we add a second antibody and we make a little sandwich. So your growth hormone's there and there's an antibody on the bottom, which is a protein, and an antibody on the top, which is a protein, and they got a little reporter molecule which can produce light when you add other chemicals to it. And so we add the other chemicals to it and a flash of light comes and if we measure the amount of light that comes off with a photomultiplier, that is proportional to how much growth hormone is present. That's how the IGF-1 assay works also. These tend to be fully automated methods. So you buy an instrument and they give you the reagents and that's how we're doing it. We could make our own IGF-1 assay but um, we, we just sort of up to our ears in doing other, other assays right at the moment although we have toyed with doing our own IGF-1 assay. So we measure how much light comes off and that tells us how much growth hormone is present. So what are the challenges? Well, if you think about how to measure things, you have to have some pure component in order to, like you'll put in, you, let's say you put a, a, a sample that you've, a, 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 stock sample that you've prepared of a particular concentration of growth hormone and you measure how much light comes off that one and then you put the patient sample and you measure how much light comes off that one and then you can compare them and see what the relative concentration is and how high the patient is. Problem is growth getting pure growth hormone is a very hard thing to do. So the original way to get pure growth hormone was to take you know, pituitaries from dead people and munch them up and purify out the growth hormone but now there are um, it, there are ways to make this in a recombinant fashion and so growth hormone is manufactured recombinantly however it isn't fully natural growth hormone and there's actually different types of growth hormone so it's not all the same thing we're not actually measuring all the same thing there is an international standard for growth hormone and but pure growth hormone is hard to manufacture and there are different forms of growth hormone so which one should we measure so there's you know debate in the literature about that should our assays pick up this alternate form of growth hormone that actually functions, maybe it doesn't function quite the same. So that's all the, the, just trust me that there are people who make their life worrying about growth hormone in the weeds of the scientific community. So the, the other thing is a growth hormone degrades quickly in the tube and so you have to be mindful of that. If the sample sits out on the counter for an hour because somebody's busy taking care of, you know, some other patient care issue, your growth hormone is like 
degrading away. And so we try to prevent those things from happening. And then there are the, the people challenge. The people challenge is that growth hormone is not released continuously. It's released in pulses in response to stresses, right? So if I wanted to diagnose you with acromegaly and I measured your growth hormone, I might not catch it when it's being released and I might get a normal result. So that's the people challenge of measuring growth hormone. Now, when you, if you have severe acromegaly, your growth hormone will be high all the time. But in the normal situation, if you measure my growth hormone now, you might detect it because I'm up here. But if I went and you know, chilled out for a while, you might measure it and it's not there. Okay, so it comes in little spikes. So you'd have to measure growth hormone over and over and over and over again inside of a day if you wanted to diagnose acromegaly with growth hormone. And that's why we don't diagnose acromegaly with growth hormone. So when do we use growth hormone testing? Well, we use growth hormone testing to, the, to monitor the extent of surgical or medical control of acromegaly in people who have acromegaly. So what we try to do is suppress it and see if we can suppress it. And one of the ways in which you can suppress growth hormone is giving people a sugary drink. So how many people have had the sugary drink? Isn't the sugary? It's wonderful, isn't it? It's like, yeah, it's like, I think it's got the sugar of like two and a bit Coca-Colas in one drink. So what, what we're doing there, remember growth hormone goes up when your blood sugar is low. Growth hormone goes down when your blood sugar is high. And so what we're trying to do is squish your, glute, squish your growth hormone level down. And if we can squish it down, we can prove that you're under adequate control. Now, what constitutes adequate control is actually dependent on which assay you're using. If you're using a modern assay that only detects growth hormone, like we are using in BC, that's about 0.5 is considered adequate suppression after the administration of glucose. You will see some publications say less than one. The reason they say less than one is because they're, they're leaving it more wide open for older assays that didn't just detect growth hormone, but detected other things too. But the better we get at measuring growth hormone, the lower that threshold of what constitutes adequately low growth hormone after uh, the administration of the drink. So what we're currently doing right now, if we get a result below 0.5 at the two hour mark after the drink, then we'll say that's adequate. If we get a result between about 0.5 and 1, we'll say that's marginal. And if we get a result above 1, we'll say that's definitely not control. Because it's not really clear what constitutes perfect control of your acromegaly. Because it's all a continuum, right? It, it's a continuum, and it's hard to say, like, right at this level, things are perfect. Because, you know, it's gradually good and gradually bad and somewhere in the middle. We, we have to define what constitutes adequate. Okay? Now, sometimes, if you catch it early, you end up being too good at lowering your growth hormone. So you've lost all your ability to make growth hormone. And so you could have growth hormone that would be, on average, say, less than 10% of the population average. And in those circumstances, um, particularly in the other types of pituitary surgery, some people end up taking growth hormone um, uh, because it does have some mood improvement effects. Okay, so what else might we test? Well, you may have seen, some of you may have, your tumor may have manufactured both growth hormone and prolactin. Uh, it, it, that those commonly go together because the same type of cell makes both, and in simple terms. And so one of the side effects of growth hormone is actually to have nipple discharge of milk outside of pregnancy. That's called galactorrhea. That can happen to men, too, because there is glandular, uh, there is, there's glandular tissue in the male uh, breast, and there is a duct in the male breast, so men can have nipple discharge. So we measure prolactin because we want to know, one, if your tumor is making prolactin, and two, we want to know if you can also get too much prolactin if the tumor impinges on the, the, the pituitary stalk. Remember, this, it's like a berry, right? If you, if you impinge on that pituitary stalk, it turns out that you make more prolactin in that circumstance, too. So you'll see people getting that measured. But we also measure all the other things that the pituitary makes if you've had the surgery or even before the surgery, because we want to know, has a tumor squished the other normal cells in the pituitary to an extent that they no longer function? So we're interested in whether you have enough adrenocorticotropin hormone, or ACTH, and that 
in turn makes cortisol. We want to know whether you're fertile, whether you're making FSH, LH, and in women, estradiol, pro, pro, progesterone, and in men, testosterone. We want to know if your thyroid's functioning. Are you making TSH, the thyroid stimulating hormone, and is your thyroid producing enough thyroxine? So you can get low levels of all of these hormones from the surgery or from the tumor itself. So what can go wrong with the testing? Well, sometimes, and Dr. Johnson has seen this before, and I've seen lots and lots of this, sometimes if the test doesn't make sense, clinical acumen always wins. So if you get a really wonky result, uh, it's completely reasonable to challenge it. Sometimes if a patient, particularly if a patient is, has an inflammatory condition like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or something like that, or hepatitis C would be another one, or if they have been exposed to a lot of barnyard animals, they will make anti-animal antibodies by themselves, which is fine, except when we want to use animal antibodies in our test. And what ends up happening is that they can connect that signal antibody and that capture antibody together and create a parent growth hormone signal or a parent IGF-1 signal when there's none there. That's called the heterophile effect. So sometimes lab tests are imperfect. And so whenever a clinician gets a lab test result that doesn't fit with the clinical picture, they should think about whether that actually makes sense. And I'm, you know, I'm a lab person. I say you should always doubt the lab because we try and do our best, but the clinical presentation always wins. So if somebody doesn't have features of uh, growth hormone excess, but is getting a high growth hormone or IGF-1 result, then it could very well be that the test is the thing that's wrong. So tests are not perfect. Insulin-like growth factor one, it's kind of a mouthful. It's not the biggest mouthful I've ever seen in, in biochemistry. There are bigger, bigger mouthfuls than that, but IGF-1 is an even shorter protein. It's only 70 building blocks long, 70 amino acids long, and it has three internal bridges, and it, I don't know if you care about the molecular weight, but it's 7,600. And it's made in the liver in response to growth hormone. It's the one that causes all the acromegaly effects, right? The disease is primarily mediated through the effect of insulin-like growth factor one. Now, insulin makes blood sugar go down, but IGF-1 makes blood sugar go up. So it's not quite, it's only insulin-like. It's not a perfect match, and it doesn't fit the insulin receptor. So it doesn't act like insulin biochemistry from a biochemical perspective, but it looks like insulin, and it shares building blocks with insulin. It shares structural, uh, we say structural homology with insulin. So this is what I mean. So this is, this is um, uh, IGF-1 on, yeah, on the left, and this is insulin on the right. And so you can see that they both form this kind of like snaky uh, shape. They both have three internal, uh, this is actually pro-insulin. The, the precursor of insulin, they, they have, it has three internal uh, 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 stabilizing bridges. And so and if you went and looked at each of the building blocks and compared the letters, you would discover that there are similarities in how the letters are laid out. And so that's why we call it insulin-like, because it's like insulin. Right? Insulin-like, in, IGF-1 is actually stuck on a protein called insulin uh, IGF, insulin-like growth factor binding protein 3. So sometimes as a surrogate for IGF-1, pe people measure IGF-BP3. If you're from Alberta, they frequently measure IGF-BP3 when they want to know if the IGF-1 is low. They do that in kids. So you can measure either IGF-1 or IGF-BP3. They, they kind of go together. One rises and one falls together. The IGF-BP3 concentration is higher, makes it a little easier to measure. We don't offer that test in BC. Um, if you're going to measure IGF-1 and it's stuck inside of this IGF-BP3, because that's what happens, it's a little carrier protein that stabilizes it, how can you measure the IGF-1 if it's stuck inside of IGF-BP3? So the first thing we have to do is separate them, and then we have to measure the IGF-1. So we separate them by adding IGF-2, which forces it, it's like, you know, if this was a relationship, you would destabilize it with millions of beautiful girls and then it would fall apart, right? And, sorry, that was a slightly politically incorrect way of framing that. And so IGF-1 comes off. Now it's free, and we can measure it. We can extract it. We extract it with acidified ethanol, the same ethanol that you drink. 
and then we measure IGF-1 by that ELISA principle. Now, one of the challenges with IGF-1 determination, I'll explain this scattergram that my friend made, um, is that it changes its concentration a lot with age, and so the normal ranges are a big challenge. That's why you'll see your normal ranges, you know, you may have compared, you know, this year's report to last year's report in the normal range, and you danced in and out of the normal range. Well, part of that dancing is your own physiology, because your own IGF-1 concentration does this, and part of that dancing is because the normal range moves with age, and part of that dancing is just how the sample was handled, how the reagent manufacturer's lot worked. But here's the, the long and short of it. This is a plot of IGF-1 results in about 1,500 people as a function of age. So each dot is a person. It's their IGF-1 concentration. The concentration's on the y-axis and their age is on the x-axis. And what this shows with the blue line is that when you're a little kid, your IGF-1 concentrations are about the same as when you're 80. And then you start to grow, and in your teen years, eight, 17, 18, 19, your IGF-1 concentrations are well into the acromegalic range. In fact, what, what you do here is everything within the blue dashed line, the two blue dashed line is considered normal. And so you've got teenagers whose IGF-1 is 200, and teenagers whose IGF-1 is 600, and that, you know, 300 to 600 is in the acromegalic range, but that's fine when you're a teenager because you're supposed to grow. Your face is supposed to fill out, your forehead is supposed to get bigger, your hands are supposed to get bigger, your feet are supposed to get bigger, and then it all stops because in adulthood, it comes back down. But as you progress through adulthood, you can see that the concentration declines to the time when you're 80, it's back to what it was when you are a baby, just in time for you to be back into diapers, right? Just like you were, yeah, I know, we're all headed there. They should, they, so this should be a closed loop, right? We end up back <laughs> like kids and dependent again. And so I'm feeling it. I'm right here. <laughs> Michelle is just ahead of me. <laughs> and so what you can see here is that there's actually a science of trying to figure out what the normal range is. They've done the fitting two different ways. They've done the math two different ways. And so you can see that what constitutes normal, either within the red or the blue, is different depending on your due statistics. So some of it is statistical artifact, OK? Somebody's, just let me silence my phone here that it's, um, some of it, what you're seeing is statistical artifact. But, I would expect that most of you would reside close to the upper blue line unless you're fully cured and you're fortunate enough to be fully cured and you'd probably be somewhere in here. Or if your surgery um, ended up uh, injuring your normal growth hormone production, you might be down towards the bottom end. Okay, so there's a lot of interest in particular uh, measuring IGF-1, not using an, an ELISA-type method like we track classically use, but to measure it use it by its molecular weight directly with what's called a mass spectrometer. Now, we, we, th that's how it was done on that previous figure I just showed you. Uh, the challenge with this is that um, there's actually a normal variant for IGF-1 in the population that has one of the amino acids swapped out. It still functions. And if you measure by its mass, you'll miss that. So that's one thing that's problematic. You'll also miss um, other mutant forms of IGF-1 that exist in the population but function. Uh, and so we've decided for the time being not to, not to do it this way, uh, not to measure it by its mass, but we do that for a lot of other uh, proteins right now. So if it, it, the, a lot of labs are doing it this way. Quest Diagnostics, biggest lab testing facility in the world is doing their, all their IGF-1s by mass spectrometry. Um, the Mayo Medical Lab does it, offers it that way also. What are the advantages? Well, you don't have to rely on a commercial m reagent manufacturer. You can just use chemicals that you can buy from chemical companies like Sigma. Um, and we can control the assay a little more, but it's technically much more demanding. It's much more demanding of the lab staff to do IGF-1 this way with an in-house method 
than to do it with a commercial method. Like yesterday, our, these instruments require compressed nitrogen, and our nitrogen compressor broke, and there was all pandemonium, like how are we going to get the vitamin D results out and the testosterone results out. So what about the effects of drugs? Well, drugs that block the growth hormone receptor, uh, we can't measure GH because it'll always be high, so we have to measure IGF-1 as a surrogate. Um, and drugs that inhibit GH production, um, uh, either GH or IGF-1 can be measured. So depending on your drug, if you're on one of the drugs, you may find that you're not being subjected to one or the other, uh, well, to growth hormone testing. Do we measure the drug levels? We actually could measure the drug levels with the mass spectrometer. Um, but right now, we don't do therapeutic drug monitoring for the drug levels themselves. We monitor the out the performance of the drug as it comes to your own physiology. Uh, there are There is interest in measuring drugs frequently, particularly for very expensive drugs, because if you could lower the dose, you could save a little money, but there's the flip side of that. If you find that it's disappearing too quickly, you end up costing you more. Now, just one more thing, if you're from a province that has a number of providers for IGF-1 or growth hormone, IGF-1, depending on which commercial assay you're using, you'll get numerical results that are not comparable to one another. You'll induce all kinds of inappropriate joy or fear, depending on which direction your IGF-1 moves, if you go to different labs who are using different vendors. So what I would suggest, if you're doing growth hormone monitoring with oral glucose tolerance, the drink, or you're getting IGF-1 measured, that you would pick a lab and always go to it, okay? It doesn't even matter if that lab does the testing, they'll always be sending it to the same place if they have a relationship. So find a lab that you're satisfied with the service and always go to the same place, don't jump around. Now in BC, it doesn't really matter because growth hormone is measured across BC by the same method, which is from Roche, and IGF-1 is measured by the same method also. But if you're in another province where there's multiple labs doing this, and you'll be able to tell from the reports where it was done, what I'd suggest is always go to the same place. And, and that's probably a good maxim to apply for any kind of pituitary-related testing, whether you're me te measuring your cortisol or your thyroid function. It's good always to have the same test, unless you think the test isn't making sense clinically, it doesn't match what your, your scenario, if you think something's wrong, then you might want to arrange for a different different. Uh, location and with that, that may have been like that may, that may have been like woo, and some are like yeah, science. Um, <laughs> we'll open it up to questions. So we have about, I think I have about f five. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I gotta go do some things and I'll come back. Okay. But we, oh, we're gonna, we want to save the questions for. Well, I'd like to. Okay, all right. Well, if, if anyone's like me and will likely forget their question by this afternoon. Uh, there, you're welcome to ask me on the side. So with that, I think we're having lunch now. Okay, thank you.